Madam Chair, Madam Chair, parliamentary inquiry. Yes, ma'am. How, how is it? The, the gentleman is recognized. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. How is it a member um, expected to meaningfully participate in this very important committee hearing while we're walking uh, back and forth from the Capitol to cast votes, which are in 20 minute blocks? Those of us that do not participate in what we believe to be unconstitutional proxy voting. How does the chair expect us to participate meaningfully in this committee while we walk back and forth from the Capitol to vote? It's a serious question. Yeah, this is not a parliamentary inquiry. We're keeping this committee hearing going while allowing members to go to vote. Uh, else we'll be here all night. Uh, the is, is there, the is there some, the is there some hesitancy to, de to devote the time that's required for this very important hearing? Madam Chair? Uh, sir, we are devoting all the time that is required, uh, but members have to vote. They need to go to vote. Which is exactly why we should adjourn. I object to that not happening, and I, I like the it on the The gentleman's request is denied. The gentleman from California, Mr. Kahana, uh, is recognized was that an official for five move to minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, Did you for move to adjourn? your leadership. Uh, thank you, Director Ray, uh, for your service. Director Ray, you have told uh, House committees that you need to look hard at what happened. You are committed to doing better. Uh, you told Chairwoman Maloney that uh, you have to bat a thousand percent, and even one mistake is unacceptable, and you will make sure this never Madam ever Chair, I, I move to again. adjourn. Madam Chair, if I could uh, pause, I, I'm not There's being been a motion, Madam Chair. It doesn't have the floor. The gentleman is not recognized. Mr. Uh, Mr. It is Mr. Conestein. You know, Madam Chair, we had an insurrection. We don't need disruptions here. Can we allow the democratic process to continue, please? Some, some of our members would like to hear the complete testimony. Well, I, I think that we should follow the rules. That's the rules state problem. that if there is a motion to adjourn, that we have to have a vote immediately. Madam Chair, we have, a, we have a motion on the floor. A motion on the floor. Regular order. Regular order. The gentleman will suspend. Regular order is there's been a motion made and we vote on the motion. Ma Madam Chair, may I continue my line of inquiry? The gentleman, Mr. Kahana, will continue. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Director Ray, you have said that you have to bat a thousand percent, that there is no room for a mistake. But Director Ray, uh, instead of speaking in generalities, you know, I mean, if there was a football coach after a losing season who gave those generalities, that wouldn't cut it with the American public. So I want to drill down on specifics. Was this an intelligence failure on the part of the FBI? Director I wouldn't describe it that way, uh, but I would say that we consider what happened on uh, January 6th to be unacceptable. We share. No, I, I don't want the generalities, sir. I don't want the platitudes. I want the specifics of what went wrong. Like someone would say, our quarterback was, didn't throw correctly. We didn't have enough uh, defense. What are the specifics? Don't give me any platitudes. What, did the FBI have any intelligence that was actionable about what happened on January 6th? Yes or no? To my knowledge, sir, we did not have actionable intelligence that indicated that hundreds of people were going to breach so, the Capitol. So wouldn't this be an intelligence failure if you did not have actionable intelligence and if uh, the CEO of Parler knew what was going on and half of social media and half the folks per in, in, on the Internet knew what was going on? Wouldn't you describe that as an intelligence failure? Well, I, I'm not trying to quibble on terminology, sir. I, I guess what I would just say to you is that anytime there's an attack, we consider that to be uh, unacceptable, and we're determined would, to try to get you better say sources you need to get, so do that we a better, can have more information. Would you say you need to do a better job getting intelligence on these kind of attacks? Yes, sir, I do, would say that, and if, right. I'm glad you raised that, because that's one of the things, if you want to sort of take it out of the realm of, of what you're calling platitudes, that's one of the things that we are particularly focused on is how can we develop better human sources to anticipate things like this? That's one. How can we develop better data Was there a failure? Did you have any intelligence which you failed to act on, or is it your testimony that there was no actionable intelligence? I am sitting here right now recognizing that this, as, as has already been discussed, a sprawling investigation, 
I am not aware of any actionable intelligence that we failed to pass on. You spoke about uh, how, again, you, yeah. how you were uh, surprised that there were no uh, individuals who were arrested of the 500 that you had investigated. I was shocked. I, I said, how is it possible that you have 500 of these individuals who have never been investigated by the FBI? Uh, does it concern you that none of the people who were arrested were on your radar at the FBI? Uh, well, two things. One, uh, I think I said almost none, not none. You but did? Second, uh, certainly, second, certainly the investigation is ongoing, uh, and facts will develop further as we go forward. Did, did you third, have preliminary? Yes, but third, yes, yes. That is one of the things that I, I, I view as most important to us, which is we obviously had lots of very well-predicated, important investigations that we were conducting. Did you have any investigations, sir? My time is running didn't. out. I don't want to be rude, but did you have any investigations on Oath Keepers, Proud Boys, or Three Percenters? Uh, we, I know we had investigations related to individuals connected with some of those groups. I can't, sitting here right now, uh, separate in my head which investigations were before do you, January Do you think 6th, in retrospect you should have paid more attention and intelligence to some of the white supremacists and extremist groups and that there was not sufficient intelligence done on those groups? I'm not sure I would go that far. And here, let me just tell you why. We have, during my time as director, dramatically increased, I think doubled the number of investigations that we have been conducting specifically into what we call but, racially motivated violence. But you don't think if there were all these arrests, sir, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you don't think that if there were all these arrests and none of them were people or almost none were people that you had investigated and half the internet is talking about these folks and knows about these folks, that the FBI needs to do a better job in, in, in getting intelligence? And then let me just ask this final sure. question, which you can ask. If you knew before January 6th what the FBI knows now about the militia groups conspiring to attack the Capitol, would the government have been able to thwart this attack? Well, on the first part, I think I've been very clear consistently that I think the FBI needs to do better, and we're determined to do better. On the second part, it's hard for me to answer a hypothetical. Certainly, if we had information that we've been developing in our investigations since January 6th, before January 6th. And Director Ray, does it make your job able. harder when some of the lawmakers in this body are praising the protesters, some even saluting with a, a clenched fist the protesters? Does that make the job of the FBI harder to get after uh, those who uh, harmed our democracy? Uh, I guess the best way for me to answer that is I certainly understand why you're asking the question, but I think it's best for me as FBI director to speak through our work and not to be weighing in uh, on in commentary on specific people's rhetoric, but I certainly understand why you're asking the question. I appreciate your service, sir. The gentleman's time has expired. In the FBI's view, the top domestic violent extremist threat comes from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, specifically those who advocated for the superiority of the white race. That is an absolute flat out lie. It is not our greatest threat. Not once in his speech today did Merrick Garland mention last summer's BLM riots or skyrocketing crime on our streets, the riots we still see week in and week out. How about Merrick Garland? You condemn this man on your screen, Justin Tyran Roberts, arrested for shooting five people in a 20 hour shooting spree in Georgia over the weekend. You know why he did it, according to investigators? They insist he was intentionally targeting white, military-looking men. That sounds racially motivated to me. He didn't mention that. No mention of this black-on-white crime because it doesn't fit their divisive narrative. These are stories that are actually happening in America. How about we stop issuing fake warnings about crime based off of political agendas and start prosecuting all criminals no matter what color they are. When you're up there, are you just getting tired of being told you're a racist, I'm a racist, everybody watching is a racist? Yeah. They have to talk about January 6th, and they have to talk about things that divide us on, uh, along racial grounds. It is, it is so wrong, but that's who the Democrats are today. They're this radical left-wing party, and they have nothing else positive to talk about, so they have to go here. You know, you look at January 6th, everybody has said it was a tragic day, it never should have yep. happened, they wanted people that were violent and destructive put away. 
But, you know, I was looking at Senator Ron Johnson. He looked at hours and hours and hours of tapes, and he was like something like 40% of the people were just let in by Capitol Police. But they don't talk about any of that. And you have SWAT teams showing up in California at somebody's house, trying to rouse them out of the house for walking around taking selfies inside that Capitol. It isn't right, Congressman. Or how about the couple in Alaska who weren't even in the Capitol? I mean, look, you're right. We Republicans have been, conservatives have been consistent. We condemned the violence that took place on January 6th, and we condemned all of it that took place all last summer with all these, uh, in all these metropolitan areas around our, around our great country. The Democrats are the ones who have been hip hypocrites on this. They did, they, last summer was fine. That was a righteous cause. But then they focused on, on January 6th. But the couple in Alaska who weren't even in the Capitol, the FBI kicks in their door, holds them at gunpoint, handcuffs them, interrogates them for four hours. They got the wrong couple. And then they take their phones, their laptop, and their pocket-sized copy of the Constitution. Talk about, I mean, th th there's got to be irony in that, that, that fact alone. So, yeah, th where's the consistency that we would like from everyone? We've been consistent. I wish the Democrats would do the same. Yeah. Well, there's my pocket constitution. I carry it with me all over the place. <laughs> and I'm in Texas, Congressman. Come and take it. Usually we're talking about guns. This time I'm talking about my constitution. In the FBI's view, the top domestic violent extremist threat comes from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, specifically those who advocated for the superiority of the white race. Garland did not provide any numbers or statistics to back up this claim, but pointed to past racially motivated shootings and attacks, as well as the January 6th riot on Capitol Hill. Noticeably, Garland spent his entire 26-minute speech without even mentioning the summer of riots one time, simply ignoring months of attacks on police and federal buildings and cities all across this country as if it just didn't happen. Steve, I think this shows how politicized Biden's DOJ has really become ignoring vi radical violent groups like Antifa, like BLM, simply because they support the left-wing agenda. Yeah, unfortunately, it's another example of two sets of rules or two sets of narratives, really, in a way. And the narrative being spread here, of course, is that January 6th is, uh, was a, a riot that somehow endangered the American Republic, which is not in any sense true. It was an unarmed riot, inexcusable for, to be sure, but unarmed. No, not one person has been charged with having a firearm inside the Capitol that day, and it lasted a few hours. To try to compare that to weeks of rage and carnage up, across the summer last year in 2020 um, is just totally ludicrous and illogical. Unfortunately, that's right where Merrick Garland went. They're essentially pitting Americans against one another by labeling it via basically a race war, which is essentially what they're implying with that statement. And I don't agree with it. And I think it's absolutely horrifying to see that you have the DOG, DOJ essentially being weaponized against the American people. There was, a, there was a rally in Chicago of white supremacists on January 25th. And they put out a national call and they got 80 people to show up in Chicago. And according to one expert, five people were from the Chicago area. Out of about, what, eight or nine million people who live in Chicago, there were five people. Right. And so a lot of this uh, the southern, the, relies on the Southern Poverty Law Center and the statistics that they put out and the media regurgitate that. And so I think we have to be careful. Certainly, I, I do not trust the media uh, on this issue because they, they have proven themselves to be, uh, you know, not reliable when it comes to being partisan and pushing certain narratives. So um, is white supremacy, it, is there some in the United States? Absolutely. Is it the most uh, biggest threat to, to America? I think that's overblown, and I think that the administration is pushing it for their own political reasons. You know, it seems to me that race relations in America in recent decades have improved so dramatically that things like, for example, interracial marriages are totally unremarkable in America today. Uh, and it is not considered acceptable in polite society at all to have racist views. And yet we have people like Garland and Joe Biden who want to insist that the country is systemically racist. Are they essentially protesting a struggle that has already been won in American culture? You know, there has been tremendous progress in this country. And, and for a lot of folks uh, on the left to, to, as they're saying now, this is, you know, voting rights, it's Jim Crow 2.0, that there's been no progress made since the 1960s or even the 1860s. I mean, that is, most Americans understand that's ludicrous. I mean, that is gaslighting, right? That is an absolute gaslighting right. of the American people. And so I think, uh, again, in our normal everyday lives, we do not see the bogeymen that are being made out. There are not Klansmen walking around the corner. There are not white supremacists uh, gathering on street corners. And so I think, uh, you know, that ultimately falls flat to the American people because that's not what we see and we live in our day-to-day -day lives. Right. And we understand that racism is really 
uh, you know, has has been a thing of the past. I mean, does it still exist today? Sure, it does in certain areas. But is the is the country systemically racist and oppressive? I don't think most people believe that.